Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Dana Buckler Show. My name is Dana, and my guest today is Matt Singer. Matt is a film critic, author, podcaster, editor of ScreenCrush.com, and the chair of the New York Film Critics Circle. Matt's latest book is Opposable Thumbs, How Siskel and Ebert Changed Movies Forever. And let me just start by saying I had an opportunity to finish this book over this past week. I loved it. It was incredible. Matt, welcome to the Dana Buckler Show. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? You you have a very good radio voice, so I'm I'm feeling like I should I'm I'm feeling a little inferior. No, and a little. Oh, I'm I'm doing great. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> That's right. the voice I hear in my head when I speak. Well, I don't hear that, Matt. And let me just start by saying I was obvi- honestly a little nervous chatting with you. I'm, I'm a big fan of yours, so that was a really good icebreaker. So I appreciate that. Thank good. you. Good. So now we've broken the ice. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, I have some questions about the book, but before that, I, mm-hmm. I, I had, this is the first, mm-hmm. first thing I, I want you to speak on. If you could for the younger generation, can you speak to the power that the movie critic had and especially the power and influence of Siskel and Ebert? Well, in their heyday, yes, they were very powerful. They did have a lot of influence. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they were certainly kind of extreme examples. I, I guess in in that era, and we're talking from the mid-1970s to the late 1990s was when Siskel and Ebert was a thing, went under different names on different networks and syndication and public television. But as an entity of these two specific people, Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, doing a show together, it was about 25 years. And in that period, once they really got going, yes, they did have a fair amount of of power and influence. uh, And and, um, people did pay attention to what they had to say. I mean, the subtitle of my book is a little hyperbolic, but it's about how they changed, you know, how Siskel and Ebert changed movies forever. And there's a lot of ways that they, they did that, I think. And yeah, I mean, they absolutely, their show was, you know, uh, because it was a different time and it was an era when, you know, there was, I guess by the end of the show, there was an internet, but not as we know it now. And certainly there wasn't things like YouTube and, uh, you know, places to watch movie trailers, cell phones, cell phones with YouTube on them. You know, for a long time, this was one of the places, their show this was one of the places to get good information about movies that are coming out and to see clips from movies, not just the trailer that the studio wants you to see, but like sort of other clips and to get two really unbiased opinions about those movies. And uh, yeah, I mean, in their heyday, millions of people were tuning in every single week to the show. So it, yes, it did have a lot of uh, influence in the movie world in that era. You know, Matt, I think you and I are roughly around the same age. And I grew up on a steady diet of Siskel and Ebert. They were my go-to. But I'm curious, you know, what did Siskel and Ebert mean to you growing up? What did they mean to me growing up? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a, huge, a hugely, hugely formative experience watching that show. Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't even... Uh, a huge movie fan when I discovered the show in sort of my early teens was when I kind of found the show. And before that, I obviously, I went to the movies and I watched movies at home on VHS and I I liked movies, but it was certainly not like the all-consuming obsession of my life. You know, I was much more into comic books at that time. I was really into baseball, you know, like uh, this was, it was not like the defining thing of my life was to watch movies and to talk about movies. It was this show and and watching it, you know, from the age of like 12 or 13 on that really was the thing that made me obsessed and made me crazy about movies and movie criticism and talking about movies and not just seeing whatever movie was being hyped on television in commercials or whatever movie was playing at the the you know the freehold metroplex in new jersey where i grow up or the movie city five in east brunswick you know it was like because yes uh, siskel and ebert talked about those movies of course they did but they also talked about you know, art house movies, foreign movies, documentaries, um, older movies, because they had a, a weekly home video segment where they would recommend uh, older movies that were new on home video. And so watching the show was really the gateway for me to discovering all of that stuff and, and falling in love with it 
And so, yeah, I mean, without the show, I really don't know what I would be doing with my life and where I would be. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it's in my, it's sort of one of the monumental things in my life, you know, um, uh, that absolutely defined me as a young person who was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be at that. It hit me at just the right age for that. Um, and absolutely became this singular, you know, obsession, uh, in my life. What was the inspiration for you to write the book? Where did that come from? Well, I mean, a lot of it was what I just yeah. told, told you, was that yeah. it was this thing that, um, you know, that I was absolutely obsessed with. I've always felt there should be a book about them, and uh, there hasn't been. Obviously, Roger Ebert wrote books, and he wrote a memoir, and it's a great memoir. Um, but it's it's the Roger Ebert memoir. It's not the Siskel and Ebert book. And, you know, that that book has it has, I think, three chapters about Siskel and Ebert. And so, you know, you, you, you look at it and you go, OK, well, he talks about Siskel and Ebert here. But it felt to me reading it again. I mean, I, I've owned it since it came out. Um, but, you know, when I first started thinking about this as a as a as maybe I should be the one to write this book if nobody else has. I looked at the, at that memoir again and read the whole thing again and said, OK, well, it's it's not the Siskel and Ebert book there. There could still be a book out here. So that was that was really important. And then, you know, it was this is, uh, you know, I wrote about this in the book, in the acknowledgments at the back. And it's totally true. I was, you know, I was looking for a new project to write about after having written a couple of other books and was putting together lists. Uh, I had a new agent who, you know, I was trying to kind of convince actually at this point, he wasn't even really my agent. I was kind of trying to convince him to be my agent and sending him lists of ideas and stuff. And originally the the list didn't have Siskel and Ebert on there. And uh, before I sent it to the agent, I showed it to my wife and, and said, what do you think about this? And she was like, well, it's fine, but uh, uh, you know, some of these are great, good ideas. Like, I'm sure they would be good books, but why isn't Siskel and Ebert on here? Because, you know, she's known me for about uh, 23 years now. So she knows, you know, the poor thing. She knows the obsessions. And, um, yeah, she was she was like, yeah, you should do this. And I was like, well, I, 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 I what I initially said was, you know, I'm a little intimidated because Ebert has a – you wrote a memoir and we're talking about these two – hugely important and influential figures and it's it's, it's it's an intimidating task and so she said you, you can you know first of all get the heck over yourself stop being such a neurotic you it's you'll you would do a good job and more importantly she said if anybody else does it you know you're kind of lucky that no one's done it yet and if anyone else does do it and you had the chance to do it and didn't you'll forever be kicking yourself about that and I thought about that and I was like, damn it, she's right. I am that petty. I would be upset. So <laughs> that was it. So that was kind of the combination of all the factors. I kind of sucked it up and I put it on the list. And sure enough, that was the one that the agent was like, yep, that's that's the winner. And uh, that was it. That was the, the start of the whole thing. And I'm always curious. I'm always fascinated by the behind the scenes, especially on how projects get off the ground. So I always want to ask a question like this, Matt. Once you've made the decision, and maybe you can take me to exactly what the time frame is, you know, exactly when you've made this decision, you're going to do this. What is the very first thing you do to prepare for this book? Well, I mean, it's hard to, yeah, it's like, what was the very first thing? Maybe it was rereading the Roger Ebert memoir to make sure that there was still a book out there to do. That was certainly one of the first things. Um I think I probably did a little looking around to see because obviously there isn't, you know, a, 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 an official Siskel and Ebert website. So certainly I've looked online and watched clips through the years since the show went off the air on YouTube. But I probably did some looking to make sure, okay, are there, are there, are there enough episodes out there? Because obviously I want to try to see as much as I possibly can. Um, how much of it is online? Because at one point there was a lot online and then... At a, at a certain point after that, a lot of it got taken down. I think this was basically like, you know, Disney was the owners of the syndicated, the final version of the show. And they, in the last years of the show, had put a lot of it online on their website. And I think fans had kind of ripped a lot of it off there and then put it on YouTube when their website 
when the show got canceled finally and they, they took the website down. And so there was like nowhere to watch this stuff. And so fans started putting it up. And then I think at some point Disney like uh, threatened, you know, the way YouTube works, you know, this is ours. Take it down. And so a lot of it vanished. But thankfully, I guess maybe as years went on, they were less. They had other stuff going on. They stopped paying attention. And so slowly, little by little, stuff went back up and people made their own websites. There's this fan website. I think it's just siskelebert.org. Um, and that site has a ton of stuff as well. And so I was looking to make sure, yes, that was there was enough there that I could really say that I've watched most of the show. I mean, I can't say I've seen every single episode, but as much as is humanly possible, I think I, I feel pretty confident saying that, that, um, you know, a vast, vast, vast majority of episodes from throughout the history of the show. And then the one other thing I, I definitely did early on was um, because I had worked a little bit on two of the later versions of what had previously been Siskel and Ebert. This was after Siskel's death. But, you know, the show continued on after he had passed away. Originally, it was Ebert and Roper. And then, um, you know, unfortunately, Ebert lost the ability to speak and the show continued without him for a little while. And they tried different hosts. And and I, um, because I was a huge fan, anytime this happened, anytime I had a chance to do anything with these shows, you know, audition, get coffee, I would have done anything just because I was such a huge fan. You know, I had gotten to audition for these shows and I had gotten to work a little bit on them as kind of a contributing critic uh, uh, in different uh, the different versions of the show that had different ways of having sort of extra critics beyond the hosts. And so I had met people who had worked uh, on the show for a long time doing that. You know, I had met directors and producers. And so I kind of reached out to those people and said, you know, would you talk to me? I, I'm, I'm interested in doing a book. Um, I think, you know, the, I, I think I had sort of convinced these people when I was meeting them for the first time that I was a ginormous fan because I would geek out about, you know, meeting them, you know, oh, you're Don Dupree, you're the director of Siskel and Ebert, you know, uh, not that people don't fawn over Don Dupree and they should if they don't. He's a lovely guy and he was a great uh, TV director on that show for years and years. But like, you know, when I met him. I was really excited because I recognized his name from the credits of uh, Siskel and Ebert as a kid. And so, you know, I think they understood that I was a real legitimate fan and I wanted to do the book for the right reasons and to really pay tribute to the show and why it was so special and important. And so thankfully, just about everybody I reached out to like that said, sure, well, you know, I'll talk to you. And so that was another key early thing that I did was kind of making sure that those people who I knew, and I didn't know a ton, but I had enough people that I, I felt comfortable reaching out to. And they all said yes in the beginning. And then they could also kind of point me in the direction of other people to talk to. So, yeah, that was another very important early, early, early step. Okay. Now, the book is fantastically written. And I'm going to tell you that I, I actually did the audio book. So I got to listen to you for several hours narrate the book and i just had a great time nine hours nine, nine hour, and a half nine and a half hours absolutely and yes. i'm yes this beautiful voice i'm telling you i was all nine in nine and that. a half hours i was all in and in big chunks too i want you to know okay i'm not talking okay. like the 20 minute commute to work i'm talking two hours at a time you know for a few okay. days so i i'm when i tell you i was all in i was all in but i'm again not really knowing a lot about the process of writing books I'm curious, Matt, are you working on this book on your pace? Are you up against deadlines? Are you feeling any pressure? I'm just curious how that process works. Well, the first part of all of this is, you know, you have to put together, or at least I did, you know, I had to find a publisher. So the first part is doing like a proposal. Um, and so there's not really necessarily a deadline, uh, like a hard deadline there, you know, there's my, the agent now saying, you know, I, you know, how's it going checking in, but there isn't necessarily a specific hard date. It's really up to you to kind of motivate yourself. Then once you, or, you know, I'm fortunate enough, we did sell the book to a great uh, publisher Putnam. And so, you know, when you sign the contract, yeah, there's a deadline attached to that when they expect the first version of of the book and i suppose if you slack off or you uh have trouble or whatever maybe you don't you don't do it but i'm kind of a a crazy person with deadlines i mean my day job doing the website is constant deadlines you know uh most of those deadlines are like okay i'm give myself 20 minutes to write this or an hour or a day or whatever so 
a year or a year and a half. That's like, ah, that's, <laughs> you know, wonderful. Um, but yeah, I mean, as it goes along, uh, you, the, the, the deadline does start to loom because, you know, it's a writing a whole book and I am working all day doing other stuff. The book was mostly a project of nights and weekends. You know, I put the kids to bed and my wife is goes to bed early most nights anyway because she's a school teacher. So pretty much after she would go to bed until midnight every night, you know, three, four hours, I would get in of a second shift of working on the book. So it didn't, I mean, I did um, need like a couple of extra weeks from what the original, original deadline was because it just, I just needed a little extra time. But when I asked for that extra time, I knew I could do it with that amount. You know, I, I had all kinds of, you know, calendars and I need to do this much by this date and you need to have this. And then, you know, I'm like I said, it's like I'm I'm crazy. So I'm going, OK, I need to write this many words every day and I would do it and I wouldn't stop until I did it. Now, they may not have been the greatest words in the world. And later I would go through and revise them and edit them. But, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you, you know, you kind of have to be that sort of uh, crazy about it to get it done, because otherwise, you know, you'll never finish it. And especially with me, because I had to, um, you know, there's some days where you're like, oh, God, that was a really hard day at the day job just working so hard and i would go look at my calendar and say i gotta i gotta do something you know i'd find you know maybe i couldn't write that night but i could watch some more episodes or i could do a little more research i could read an article that i hadn't looked at before or i could re you know revise something i've already written and and tweak it or something you know and just every day chip away at it you know it's like you're you're i mean uh, I'm not a sculptor, but I almost sometimes envision it that way. It's like the block is in front of you and yeah. you kind of have to just chip away and chip away and chip away. And eventually you have the sculpture, but it takes months of chipping away to get to get to that point. Uh, it was incredible, though. Incredible work. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a couple things, Matt, that I watched the show, like I said, weekly for years. I uh, I got the feeling, I got the sense that the, the two of them, the Siskel and Ebert, they... They probably didn't get along that much when the cameras were not rolling. Uh, to the degree, I had no idea until after after your book. So I was surprised by that. I was also surprised at uh, Siskel's wicked sense of humor when it comes to, and I don't want to spoil too much of the book, but the, the cop and a half bit in the book about, you know, getting the autograph picture, the, the letter that the flight attendant gives Roger to come up to the cockpit, things like that. I, I mean, those were laugh out loud moments for me. And I'm wondering if you could speak to during your research, some of the more surprising things you learned about Siskel and Ebert. And that's a very broad question because we are cover talking about a lot of years. So I'll just ask for a few examples. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a few um, stories. I mean, like I had, uh, I had said, like I was very fortunate that I had met some people who had worked on the show, you know, kind of in my travels. So a few of the stories that are, are in there, I had heard back then, you know, like when I would work on the show, um, I would say to a, to a Don Dupree, for example, like, um, what was it like working with them? Or they, did they really get along? Did they hate each other? Like I, this is now 15 years ago that I was saying this and he would tell me a story. So I was lucky that I had heard um, some of them, you know, one story I had never heard before, that actually he, I believe it was again, Don Dupree who told me this story was the story about, um, not the, the, not the story with the, with the letter on the plane, but the story that involves first class on the plane and which seat is the best, uh, on the plane. Uh, I won't spoil the punchline, but there was this incident that apparently, you know, kind of went down in, in famous Siskel and Ebert lore involving them fighting over the, the, the one seat that they wanted on the plane. Cause they, they had determined they were the experts on everything, at least in their minds, you know. And so they had figured out this is the best seat on the plane. And I will tell you what that they, they thought the best seat on the plane was the first row on the right in first class. That's the best seat on any airplane. And so, you know, they would always fight if they were traveling together on who would get that seat. And on this particular day, well, there was a fight over it, a, a heated argument, yelling and screaming and a, and a shouting match. And... Um, Eventually, un and unusually, Gene Siskel, 
you know, like after walking away from a shouting match, came back and said, Roger, I'm going to let you take the seat. It's <laughs> this is silly. Why should we fight this way? We're bigger than this. And he let him have the seat. But there, there is a twist and there is a punchline, which I, I won't spoil. But that story I had I had never heard before. And that was a, that was a fabulous uh, story. Um, I think in terms of surprises, the other thing that I was really surprised by was not just, um, you know, stories about them fighting, because I had heard some and obviously, you know, they're kind of re their their reputation as having this very tempestuous relationship that, you know, I knew for years and years. And I had read, of course, you know, Roger's memoir when in the part that's about that about that show, like he does talk about that a little and. You know, when, uh, you know, when uh, Gene had passed away, he, you know, his obituary or in the the special episode they aired about that, you know, you, you would hear that stuff. But then going back for the book, the thing that really did surprise me that was kind of outside of that was, you know, like I said before, like I watched as much as I could, uh, hundreds and hundreds of episodes of the show. And I had expected doing that, you know, I was, uh, there would be... Uh, movies I had never heard of before. Of course, there's going to be. But I had sort of expected they would be the kind of forgettable middling to dreck out there of that era. And I haven't heard of it because why would anyone hear of these movies? They weren't very good at the time. People didn't remember them. They faded into obscurity. And what, what was genuinely surprising was how many movies got two thumbs up and that they would rave about, occasionally put on their top ten lists of the year. And that I either hadn't seen or hadn't heard of. And that really surprised me to the point where I started writing these movies down and watching them on my own and saying, these are great movies. And that was what inspired the um, appendix of the book, which is 25 of those movies, movies I hadn't seen, maybe one or two I had seen, but they were just kind of less famous movies that they loved you know we, we we a lot of people if you know siskel and ebert you know the stories about them promoting hoop dreams or gates of heaven or these little movies that kind of became bigger um because of them that they really supported and championed and helped get the word out and so i thought um i you know like these movies are really great and you know, it is a movie, uh, it is a book rather, excuse me, about film critics. And wouldn't it be nice to get a little film criticism, a little film advocacy into the book in some way and to get sort of the spirit of the show, which always, yes, was about them arguing and debating, but also was about encouraging people to go out and see great movies they might not have otherwise seen. And that was certainly true for me watching it. They, I saw so many things for the first time because of the show. And so that was the inspiration for that appendix and that, that uh, the surprise there really was yeah. the inspiration for the appendix. That's, that's awesome. Real quick. I want to ask you when you were watching the hundreds and hundreds of episodes of at the movies, did you find yourself at the point where you could predict prior to them sort of giving their opinion on the film, which way each one of them was going to go towards a movie or were you, or were you often surprised? I would say sometimes your predictions would be right and sometimes you would be surprised. Certainly all taste of all critics, you know, it can be idiosyncratic and it can be unpredictable even to the critic, you know, I'm sure. And, or to any film lover, you know, you think of, um, you know, the people listening right now. Sometimes you go, oh, I'm probably not going to like this movie. And sometimes your low expectations, you go, actually, that was pretty good. Or conversely, you go this is my kind of movie. It's a subject matter I like. It's made by my favorite director. I love the actors in it. And then you walk out and you go, eh, it could have been better. I expected more. They should have created something better. So that'll, you know, uh, so sometimes you would watch and you'd go, oh, they're not going to like this. And they, and they, and they, and they might've thought the same thing beforehand, but, but they end up giving a two thumbs up or one of them likes it and surprises you. On the other hand, there were certainly, you know, again, especially watching hundreds of episodes, you start to see, okay, well, Roger often likes this kind of movie. Gene often dislikes this kind of movie and vice versa. And often they would sort of, you know, their taste was in some ways, in some cases, not every time, but a little predictable. And like Roger loved movies about dogs, you know, he would give 
Uh, movies about dogs almost always thumbs up and if he gave it a rare thumbs down he would often sort of say it affectionately say if you like dogs or if you're you know for little kids this movie might work you know he gave Air Bud thumbs up he gave <laughs> Homeward Bound thumbs up you know he really loved movies about dogs and I think he just loved dogs in general and uh, there is like a very touching chapter in his memoir in fact about his childhood dog that his parents kind of took away from him um, and he, he kind of never got over it in some ways. And he, and I, I really think that it uh, kind of, it left this imprint on him. And I think that maybe that was expressed in some of those generous reviews to movies about dogs. Um, you know, and then, you know, Gene Siskel, uh, on the flip side, never really loved science fiction movies. Now that's not to say he didn't occasionally give sci-fi movies thumbs up. He did. If he if he liked a sci-fi movie, he would tell you. But he often would complain about them and he often had the same complaint which was, why is this movie about the future so dark, so dystopian, so cynical? Where are the optimistic movies about the future? And that was a complaint I would again watching the show, watching these episodes over that comes up a lot. And Roger was much more of a sci-fi fan. He grew up loving science fiction. He read science fiction magazines. He read sci-fi fanzines. He had his own sci-fi fanzine at one point. So he was much more open-minded about dark science fiction movies. And so that was another sort of predictable thing, you know. And, and again, not always true, but very often true. You know, dark science fiction movies would... Uh, you're more likely to get the thumbs up from Roger and the thumbs down from Gene. So those are some examples. Absolutely. And in my own personal observation from watching not hundreds, but certainly several episodes uh, is that uh, they unanimously were not fans of the slasher horror movie genre. And that was sort of something that I, I picked up on uh, quite early on. So, Matt, before we wrap things up, what is one thing you would tell somebody who was not familiar with Siskel and Ebert that is, you know what, I'm going to read this book? What, what's, what's one takeaway you think they're going to get? Well, one takeaway from the book that I would hope they would uh, take away is, I don't know, I would hope that... You know, from people who have read it, you know, one of the things that I hear that I love is that they they go and seek out episodes and they watch the show on YouTube or that siskelebert.org website. And I think one of the things that was so great for me when I was doing the research and revisiting all those episodes, you know, I suppose theoretically there is a world where I go, okay, well, I loved this show as a kid, and then I watch it now, and I go, eh, it doesn't really hold up. Um, I'm not that interested. I don't think it's really that great of a show. And what was great was to look at this show today in 2021 and two and three as I was working on this and going, this is – I love this show. I still love this show, and it's fun to watch the show now, even though – the show, new episodes haven't been on the air for almost 25 years, and it's only covering that period of time. I really think, you know, it's this wonderful resource, that show. It is a great thing to go back and look at now. And, you know, I, I, I people say journalism is the, is the first draft of history, and I do think that Siskel and Ebert, for this time period, that the, the last... Uh, quarter century of the 20th century. I mean, I really think it is like the first draft of a film history of, of what was going on at that time. You can get a great sense of the movie world from Siskel and Ebert. Turn on any episode from any point from 1975 to 1999, and you're going to get a good sense of what's new in theaters. You're going to find out what are the issues that are on filmgoers minds at the time you're going to find out what's what movies are uh, you know new to home video or what the new home video format is or things like you know uh, when colorization comes in or when the NC17 rating comes in or laser discs or even DVD right at the very end of Siskel and Ebert is the first time DVD became a thing and if you pick out any episode and watch it you're you'll you're 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 gonna walk away with like a kind of a better understanding of what the movie world was like in 
the summer of 1982 or 1999 or 1978 or whatever it is like it actually is a really valuable kind of document of that period on top of also being very entertaining and fun to watch because it you know it's 22 minutes it's the two of them going at it uh yelling at each other arguing debating and so i feel like you know that's kind of a a thing that's really uh, gratifying to hear from people who've read the book is like, you know, they, I, I've heard b- both. I've heard, you know, um, oh, I was a huge fan growing up and I hadn't watched it in a while. And I went back and watched some episodes and I had a great time doing that. And I love to hear that. And I've also heard a few, you know, like I, I knew who they were kind of, but I had never really watched the show. And reading the book made me want to go watch the show for the first time. And then I went and watched some on YouTube. Like to me, that's the real kind of, best review I can get that and the you know uh, people also going to check out again some of those movies in the appendix or saying oh I hadn't ever seen hoop dreams or I hadn't seen you know this movie or that movie that is in there and then and um getting to getting people kind of turned on to the you know the love of movies and wanting to see more stuff because again to me as much as I enjoyed the show for them bickering and bantering like you know, it really um, instilled this lo- the love of movies in me. And so if I can kind of pay that forward and pass that on to uh, to people, to the readers, that's to me, that's like uh, I, I, I did my job if I did that. And you did it brilliantly. My guest is Matt Singer. The book is Opposable Thumbs, How Siskel and Ebert Changed Movies Forever. Matt, if people want to get a copy of this book, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Uh, there is a, an official website that's um, Penguin Random House's website. So if you just Google uh, the book, my name in the book, that comes up. You can also get a, a that link, I think, at my website, which is matt-singer.net. So, you know, anywhere listed on there is is, is a great place to get it. You, all the usual retailers are there. And you can also, there's an ebook. There is the, as you mentioned, there is the the audiobook, which I narrated for nine and a half hours. So if you haven't had enough of listening to my my voice, you can hear it for nine and a half hours. Um, but yeah, I, and I I really enjoyed uh, doing the audiobook as well. So yeah, there's uh, those are the best places to to get it. Just head on over to that website and pick the the place you want to buy it. Any of those places is a is a good option. Outstanding, and of course there are. Uh, Links in this episode show notes uh, so you can go right to the sites that Matt was mentioning. Matt, uh, along with your website, if people want to keep up with you on social media, how can they do that? Uh, Well, I mean, I don't know how much I'm going to be using Twitter, but uh, I am on there at Matt Singer and on Blue Sky at Matt Singer. Uh, Instagram is, I think, at Super Pulse. Um, I've been I haven't been doing as much right now but when the book was coming out i was i put up a lot of cool stuff sort of research materials that i had found um you know uh, designs of the balcony set random articles i would come across that were pretty rare press releases for the one time that siskel and ebert almost hosted a late night talk show they were almost uh, they came within days of being uh, the hosts of the pat sajak show one night so stuff like that that's on my instagram and yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's probably about it. And of course, I work every day at screencrush.com. So you can you can find me writing over there as well. Absolutely. Well, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Dana Buckler show. I know you're incredibly busy this time of year, especially I know you've got so much going on. So for you to take just a little time out of your day to talk to me and the and the listeners about the incredible book you wrote. It means a lot to me. It sincerely does. So thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Any t- any chance I can uh, get to talk about uh, Siskel and Ebert. It's a good it's a good it's a good 30 minutes. It's a good hour. It's a good six hours. It's a good hour, year or two years of writing the book. I haven't gotten sick of it yet. I still love it. So, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for talking to me. Absolutely. And my name is Dana Buckler. And thank you so much for listening.